Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining ARC's Fireside Chat. Uh, today, we'll be talking about going back inside and creating safer institutions with rehabilitative programming. Uh, today, I have some incredible, incredible human beings that will be joining us that are all involved in making our communities better, safer, and bringing people home. Uh, so uh, just to give a little bit of context to this show, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure to go inside Solidarity Correctional Training Facility with Second Call, uh, Barrio Chinitos, and to talk uh, to incarcerated to our incarcerated community and to correctional officers and staff alike about the importance of rehabilitative program. Uh, with me uh, to share some of the insights and some of our views on both the experience and what we hope to be able to do as we move forward in the coming months and years is Skip Townsend, Executive Director of Second Call, Cesar Zunica, ARC Life Coach, Jamel Carter, ARC Life Coach, Sam Cunningham of Barrio Unidos, and Jacob Brevard, ARC Associate Director of Inside Program. So start off, because we have a packed schedule here. Skip, could you take a minute and introduce yourself? How are you doing today? And tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing at Second Call. Well, brother, thank you for having me on. My name is Skip Townsend. And um, let me say the word that Right now, I'm alive and well, not dead, not in jail. So this is a good day, brother. Thank you for asking. Um, the work that we do at Second Call is simply saving lives. We do everything possible to save a life, whether it's helping individuals get a high school diploma, whether it's helping individuals get into a career, um, regardless of if it's buying boots so they can go to work, whatever it is we have to do, the math, helping individuals with math. We help a lot of people become electricians. And um, one of the um, poster child for a second call is the guy you took into Solidarity with you, Charles Slade, call him Low Man. Um, after doing 27 years, the brother ran from me. I was looking for him to give him an a opportunity, but he thought I was on that, the stupid stuff. So he ran for about a couple months and finally said, what do you want, Skip? And I told him, brother, I got an opportunity for you. And now he's a union electrician. He's a journeyman wireman uh, doing well. And there are other stories we have like that. Little Man's not the only one. So thank you for having me on, Sam. Hey, thank you for joining us, brother. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, Sam, how are you doing today? Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work you're doing up in Santa Cruz with Barrios Unidos? All right. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Sam. Uh, I'm a reentry coordinator here at uh, Barrios Unidos. Uh, we uh, do a, a variety of work from uh, uh, prevention to intervention to reentry. You know, uh, we work with the young people in juvenile hall, we work with the kids in the community. And uh, we go inside of prisons and jails and uh, youth uh, facilities and uh, try to deliver uh, some hope and some inspiration to these uh, our incarcerated uh, family that's uh, soon to be coming home to uh, our communities. So uh, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be here with you gentlemen. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham, whose name is also Sam. We call him Big Sam. A uh, uh, long time uh, uh, friend, I consider him family. Uh, most of us do that, that have been both inside some of these stoops and, 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 and around uh, uh, the places that we now serve. Um, uh, Mr. Zuniga, sis, sir, how yes, are sir. you this afternoon? Could you tell us what have you been up to? Introduce yourself real quick, please, brother. Uh, so my name is Cesar Zuniga. I am a life coach at ARC, part of the Hope and Redemption team. Right now, splitting time with the second chance apprenticeship program. Um, since we're not going back in uh, right now, I'm mostly, most of my time consists of working with men and women that are formerly incarcerated, getting them through an 11 week program, and hopefully at the end, putting them in a union uh, position job. Hey, and thank, you, Mr. Hey, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Caesar was literally out in the field with the second chance pre-apprenticeship cohort cohort number 12, and he had to hurry up and, and get back to the office so that he could share his experience from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Carter, Jamil, how are you doing this afternoon? Could you introduce yourself and tell us what have you been up to lately? Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for allowing me to uh, be here and share this space with you, Sam, and the rest of the members on the team here today. Uh, my name is Jamil Carter. I'm a life coach with ARC. Uh, I go back into the institutions to facilitate self-help groups uh, very similar to the groups that allowed me uh, to help me in my rehabilitation. And so I facilitate uh, and build strong relationships with, with men and, and with administration and staff, man. It's some incredible work that I do, and I'm very honored and privileged uh, to be doing that work. So that's pretty much uh, 
what I do, sir. Thank you. Hey, thank you for joining us, Jamil. Uh, and, and last, but of course not least, uh, Mr. Jacob Brevard, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you've been up to uh, of late? Mm -mm. Already dropping the ball. Rookie Rookie mistake, mistake, Jacob. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. I, you know, hey, well, my name is Jacob Brevard, and uh, my official title is Associate Director of Inside Programs for the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, also known as ARC. Uh, my position just entails that uh, I supervise the Hope and Redemption team, which is made up of nine former lifers that go back into uh, California institutions and run character development and self-help groups. Uh, we also um, we also do juvenile halls in uh, DJJ. We have life coaches that go in and uh, work with the youngsters and mentor them to help them change their lives and uh, and. And, and leaving, and my last word, I just wanted to thank you, Sam, for uh, providing this space for this conversation to be had. Thank you. Hey, thank you for joining us, brother. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, before we get into the questions, I just want to ask you a couple of things that's on our chat box. One, at the end of the show, all of the contact information for both Second Call and Barrios Unidos will be on the screen. Uh, Barrios is in Santa Cruz, uh, but do, do a lot of work incredible organization. If you ever have time to stop by, please do so. Uh, second call is in Los Angeles, but do a lot of work again. If you have time, please connect. Uh, the one other question that was in the chat box was, uh, do we go inside San Diego or Richard J. Donovan? Yes, we do go into Richard J. Donovan. Reach out to us. We have life coaches that are assigned to that facility. Uh, I want to get into these questions. Uh, what, is a, what, what is meaningful? to you about going inside and speaking with the community? Like, what does it mean to you? And I'm gonna go uh, to you first, Sam. I also wanna make one thing one thing uh, clear too. Uh, Skip, who's the executive director of Second Call, was not able to attend Solid Edwards, but he's representing Sa Second Call because Charles Slay, uh, one of the brothers that did 27 years and who's now a, an ele a journeyman electrician, correct me if I say anything wrong, Skip, uh, joined us after doing 27 years, most of it in Solid Edwards, but he's, uh, in the union, and he's got to be at work. So we couldn't pull him out of his job uh, uh, to have him on the show because uh, I couldn't pay that much <laughs> to have him on the show. <laughs> but uh, definitely here with us in spirit. And, and uh, he went through second call in order to achieve the goals of becoming a, a, an electrician uh, here in Los Angeles. So we'll be sure sharing some of the insights, and you'll see pictures of him. But uh, Sam, for you, what is it? What what is meaningful? to you about going inside and speaking with the community? Uh, for me, myself, uh, just a little background. Uh, I'm a former lifer myself. Uh, I was incarcerated for 30 years. And for most of that 30 years, I truly believed and accepted that I would die in there. I, I would no longer uh, walk out of that prison as a free man. And I shared them thoughts and uh, beliefs with a whole lot of brothers that I walked that track for decades with that uh, felt the same way. So to go back in and just let them see me walking in and walking back out and get the hope and the inspiration that they too can achieve that. So that's what's so meaningful about me, going in and uh, uh, providing hope and uh, inspiration to the uh, the brothers that I walked so many uh, years off with and, and accepted that we were dying there. Hey, thank you for that, brother. Uh, Caesar, for you, what is meaningful to going back inside and speaking with our community? Uh, the meaningful part for me, Sam, it is uh, the community, our people that we left behind, them able to see the change me, the me that uh, cares about them, that is willing to sacrifice the time to go back in and continue to help them in the struggle. Um, I once said that uh, there's nothing that they can tell me that I, don't, I already know about what's going on in their mind of what they're seeing. Um, but I think just the meaningful part is to see the change in me and and for them to see how much we care about them. All right, thank you, Caesar. Appreciate that, brother. Uh, 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 Skip, I know uh, we've done some work uh, quite a bit. We continue to work together and collaborate. Uh, for you, when you go in, because I know you also go into the women facilities too and teach life skills. For you, uh, what is meaningful about going back inside and, and speaking with our community? Well, for me, brother, I think it's um, I also went to CRC and Camp Fenner where I was facilitating classes as well as CIW. But for me, it's um, 
for me, it's a humbling experience to be able to listen to individuals. Because I know when I was incarcerated, I felt like wasn't anybody listening. Did nobody hear my cries, my pleas, and what was right and what was wrong. So for individuals to come in who've had so much experience uh, in there, to be able to listen to individuals who are in there now, I think, man, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. And it's a blessing for me, a humbling experience to be able to listen to those. Thank you, Skip. Appreciate that, brother. Uh, Jamel, for you, what, what's meaningful about going back inside and speaking to our community? Um, I want to say, uh, keeping my word. Like I told brothers that I uh, left behind, like I'll, I'll be back. And I was uh, inspired to say that, not even being clear on exactly how I was going to get back in there, but it, it feels real meaning, good and meaningful for me to keep my word. But also I want to say that I saw Eugene, another brother uh, that, that paroled and came back, and how impactful that was. I saw Sam, uh, you, Sam, and Scott come to Soledad, and like to me that like and share about ARC and all the amazing work that was going on. But after seeing you there, like you and Scott come in, like the impact that it had on me, like it was incredible, bro. I like really dug in and invested in in and getting myself together and whatnot. So the impact, like that 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 I I had from when you came, and then Eugene came, like I wanted to have that that influence that type of influence with the men so that's that's what's really meaningful for me like to be able to have that kind of impact to inspire and then motivate these brothers to do the work necessary for them to come home and be productive members of society absolutely thank you jamel appreciate that i want to frame something because i'm gonna switch up questions on you uh, jacob uh, but i want to frame something for the audience the title of our show is going back inside and creating safer institutions with rehabilitative programming that's what our goal is, is to to increase the number of rehabilitative programs, not just in Solidarity, but in every prison in California, continue to shrink the carceral system. If you notice, Tracy's closing. Susanville is scheduled to close. All of this came after Prop 57, which incentivized rehabilitative programming, and, and we've continued to grow that, that, that uh, model. Part of this also is for just being completely transparent. Part of this is also important to understand that creating a safer environment for the people that, in that are in custody also creates a safer environment for the staff that are working in there. Because we need the staff and, and their union, the CCPOA, to be on board with increasing rehabilitative programs. We need every single institution to be like a Soledad or a San Quentin where you have a mecca of rehabilitative programs. So just want to frame that. So when we're saying this, we're creating a safer environment for everyone that's involved in order to bring our loved ones home whole and, and, and healed and ready to be the best version of themselves. So Jacob, what role did rehabilitative programming play in your journey through incarceration and in reentry? Uh, well, rehabilitative programming played a, played a major role in my uh, transformation. It actually expanded my thinking and helped me realize that I could change it because before that I didn't know it was possible. Uh, I wanted to change, but I didn't know how. Uh, and rehabilitative program, programming gave me an avenue to look inside myself and realize that um, I was I was not being who I who I really was. I was uh, putting on the facade. So it played a major role in me transforming, becoming a uh, productive member of society. Thank thank you, uh, Jacob. Uh, Sam, uh, like we walked off a bunch of years together, different yards. Uh, for you. What role the rehabilitative program and play in your journey through incarceration and, and reentry? Uh, it's something that they say when you don't know, you don't know. And uh, when I was first mandated uh, by the board of prison uh, here to uh, participate in uh, these uh, rehabilitation programs, I didn't know I had any problems. I didn't know I had any issues, you know. So uh, going into these programs, seeds start being planted, and when I say that, I, I went. I was forced to go, so I wasn't really into it. But as seeds began to be sold, I started realizing I did have issues that I needed to uh, uh, work with. And when I when I first started, it was I'm going to for the board. I'm going for the board. But as these seeds started sowing, and I said, okay, I, I it was it was a gradual change from wanting to. Uh, figure out some stuff for myself to get out of prison to 
one day I realized I was going to these programs because I no longer wanted to hurt people. I no longer wanted to hurt my community. So the transformation from just seeds being sold to try to get out of prison to uh, finally saying, oh, it, I need to work on issues because I done left a whole lot of pain and destruction and hurt in my community and my family. So that was big for me. When I didn't know, I didn't know. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate that. Caesar, what role did rehabilitative programming play in your journey through through incarceration? Man, it played a huge role. Uh, as a lot of you might know my story, I went to prison for a crime I didn't commit. So I honestly believe that there was nothing wrong with me. Uh, when I see myself in the mirror, I didn't think everything was wrong with me. But through these rehabilitative programs, I was able to see that even though I didn't commit this crime, I could have. And I was responsible because of who I was and uh, what I was representing and what I was part of It is what caused a young man to die. So absolutely, I was responsible. And the only way that I could see that through was through these rehabilitative programs. So if it wasn't for these programs and uh, my good friend inviting me to these programs to start getting involved, I'd probably still be in prison today because I was one of the ones that was always depending on the courts. You know, and uh, the course never came around. And if it wasn't for rehabilitation, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So I'm extremely, extremely thankful for that. And, and we're extremely thankful for, for, you, for you going through those programs because being part of the solution is definitely a, a part of what everyone is here doing, including you. And if we had not did those things, we'd not be able to have the impact we're having today. Uh, uh, Jamel, for you, what role did rehabilitative program play in, in your journey through incarceration? Oh man, it was, it was big, enormous. Uh, wouldn't be here without it. I can say that for, for a fact. Uh, like Jacob mentioned it too. I wanted to change, but just didn't know how. And that right there, man, that's that that really rings true for me as well. Like trying to figure out how to change because I would revert back to 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 the old me many times. And uh, uh, the self help groups, I could see people that already like had had some like already was skilled or have made further off in their their rehabilitation but very similar to who who i was still who i was and wanted to become so i was in a, a space where i could 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 share some of the ugly stuff that i was dealing with internally man and i had a bunch of good people around me in these self-help groups that could give me solutions to the problems that i was faced with so the the rehabilitation did did, did wonders for me sam thank you thank you, thank you brother uh so, so Skip, uh, you got a shout out uh, from Miss Hope, one of our life coaches, shown. And so, uh, I'm gonna say, I want you to pontificate upon. <laughs> that's right, I'm gonna use that word. I want you to pontificate upon what are some of the ways the second call is working to transform both the culture and the environment of institutions. Man, I think that's so important, brother. I think um, that one thing is working with individuals, right? Working with them while they're incarcerated and helping them to see, you know, the change of mindset, the behavior, the attitude. But what happens is when they get released, we put them right back in that environment that doesn't support the change. So a second call, not only do we go inside, we have to go outside and work with the families. Because it's not, if not, it's like taking a bath and putting on the same dirty clothes. So we want to help the individuals that are inside, but also help them with the transition of coming home and maybe not having the support they need from their family and figuring out ways we can help the families. But also what's really important is changing the perception. The perception that people have of individuals who who were once lifers or long termers or whatever you want to call them. We have to change the perception because a lot of times society wants to just throw them away and keep them in there. Um, so they give them names. They label them inmates. People have actually introduced themselves to me as inmate and then said their prison number. And I had to stop them and say, look, I'm the wrong person. Tell me your first name. Tell me who you are. I really want to know who you are, not inmate, not defendant, not suspect, not any of that, man, not a criminal. I want to know whose child you are. I might know your mom and dad or your grandparents or something. So we have to rehumanize, man. And as we help rehumanize the individuals who are incarcerated, we have to rehumanize them with society as well. So it's it's a three prong approach. And thank you for allowing me the time to pontificate. I don't talk that long. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. Uh, 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 Sam, same question to you, but for Barrios. Uh, what are some of the ways that Barrios Unidos 
is working to transform the culture and environment of our institutions in the state. Uh, uh, just what you said, culture, you know, of course, we go into the institutions with evidence based curriculum, you know, specifically co cognitive behavior therapy, you know, and all this old stuff. But we also we go in there delivering uh, we 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 uh, with a holistic approach, you know, the mind, the body, the spirit. Also, you know, we challenge uh, the status quo and the culture of division and separation, and we try to redirect uh, uh, our brothers and sisters inside to uh, focus on on the similarities opposed to the differences. And one of the ways we do that, we uh, have uh, uh, some curriculum that was developed by really a uh, uh, close friend to uh, Barrios Unidos, uh, Professor John Brown Charles, uh, professor at UCSC. And it's uh, the curriculum is transcommuniality, which he actually uh, is offers at UCSC. And uh, I was in one of the first classes that went through CTF. And but in 2018, I believe, uh, 2017, after I left and I was paroled, we actually, as uh, Barrios Unidos, was actually able to go in and take some of the students from UCSC that was taking the course out here and sit set side by side with some of our uh, brothers at CTF and uh, accredited uh, same class. So the, it's huge to go in there and try to change the culture and and keep them uh, from separatism and, and division and concentrate on our similarities. So that's what we do. And we just approach it in a holistic uh, 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 approach. Thank you, Sam. Uh, greatly appreciate that. And, and I also want to include for our audience to know that we also are working inside the Department of Juvenile Justice, uh, even though it's slated to close in 2023 completely and that they've stopped intake, we still work directly with the incarcerated youth that, that are in there. And I want to also uh, re-emphasize what, what Skip said. Language is important and it's powerful. People that are in custody, not inmates, not prisoners, not convicts, people that are inside these settings are human beings. They're people. They're people that are in custody. They're human beings. I, I, I'm like Skip. I don't believe in calling people convicts, parolees, or any of those. Those are labels. That's not who you are. So just wanted to emphasize that and double down on it. Uh, wanted to ask uh, uh, to everyone. So, so I'm going to start with you, Caesar. How does rehabilitative programming affect the environment for both incarcerated people and the correctional officers? Rookie mistake. No, I'm not muted. You were for a minute, bro. No, I'm not muted. Okay. It probably just froze on me. It probably just froze on me. So um, I believe the rehabilitative programs, what it does, it gives them the tools for them to not use violence as an excuse anymore, to use what they've learned through these groups to, you know, good communication skills, learn to sometimes just to walk away from situations. And that could be whether it's with a CO or with the celly or with anybody in the yard. But what's most important, and I'm going to use myself as an example, is the rehabilitative programs, uh, how they have worked for me out here in the community, dealing with road rage, dealing with somebody taking your parking, dealing with you know somebody cutting you off at the supermarket, where sometimes you feel like you want to come undone, but because you know you have a lot to lose, and you're so, you know, you, you've, you've already put a lot of these tools to practice while you were in prison, it's easy for you to sit there and say, you know what, go ahead, you get the right away, or go ahead, you know what, that was my fault, and be the bigger person. And I think that's why it's so important because once you take away the energy from the situation, it just becomes, it just becomes simple. It, 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 you know, it solves everything. You get away from the problem. Thank you, Caesar. thank you. Uh, same question uh, uh, to you, Jacob. Uh, how does rehabilitative programming affect both the environment for those that are incarcerated and for the correctional officers? Bro, like Lee, you're on mute. For me, I think the most important aspect of, of that is um, uh, the safe space. Uh, the rehabilitative programming provides a safe space for people who are incarcerated. To, uh, to enact change or transformation in their lives. And it also uh, provides a space for correctional officers and administrative staff to see uh, people who are incarcerated in a different light. 
uh, to see them in a um, in an environment where uh, that's positive and where they're striving to be the best their best selves, as opposed to uh, being on the yard and um, uh, practicing some some trauma some 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 trauma field uh, behaviors. Um, so for me, the rehabilitative program is extremely important just because it provides a safe space for people to transform uh, and change their lives. And it also uh, provides an opportunity for administrative staff and uh, correctional officers to see people in a different light. Uh, I, I, I want to just tell you that, uh, uh, a reference to change and, and transformation. It was once told to me that to change is to have a garden and switch it from um, roses to, to uh, chrysanthemums or whatever you call them. Um, and transformation is taking the garden and putting cement over it where it's no longer a garden. And I think that uh, the rehabilitative program in that space allows people to transform their lives like that. Great point. Thank you, Jacob. Jamel, same question to you. How does rehabilitative program affect the environment for both the, the incarcerated population and correctional officers? Uh, man, uh, I like to say uh, it, it's, it's positive and productive, which pretty much equals safety, uh, safety, a safe environment for everyone. Uh, I just really want to illustrate some of the uh, the power behind this. Uh, me and Caesar, which was at one point was my work wife, uh, when we go back into the prisons and, and facilitate some of the self help groups, the officer asked, could he, you know, did he mind if we sit in, if he if he could sit in in the class and just get an ear of what's being facilitated and with permission of the men that was in the groups, allowed the officer to sit in and, and listen to some of the, the work that was being done in uh, CGA, uh, Criminal and Gang Members Anonymous specifically. But at the end of the program, the officer came up and he said, thank you for allowing me to sit in. He said, but I need this as well. What they're giving, what you guys were, were talking about with, with the men in there, I need this as well. I got a lot out of just sitting here listening in the group. So I thought that was incredible, like, right? So it was there's a humanizing element in, in that right there. Like we're just humans at the end of the day and, and we come across some of the same frustrations and same things too. And so that 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 was powerful to me. And so I wanted to share that. Uh, how powerful that uh, these rehabilitative programs are for the environment and also for staff as well. Thank you, Jamel. And, and on that, I want to pivot uh, to, to first Sam and skipping the rest of the panel. How important is it to include correctional officers in the rehabilitation of our incarcerated community members? What role can they play? Sam, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it, that's a tricky uh, question because you know, uh, we talking about culture, we, the culture, the culture, all of us did a lot of time and the culture was established way before a lot of us got there and it is a line drawn in the sand, us against them. So with, with staff, whoever it may, free staff or whatever, for them to be willing to cross that line that has been drawn for so many years, us against them. It includes us all as humans, opposed to correction officers, uh, uh, people that's locked up, et cetera, et cetera, them versus us. So them being included uh, is, is huge on uh, all of us looking at each other as human beings. Something that, that you blew my mind with when we went in, inside of uh, CTF uh, a couple of weeks ago is when you gave us uh, the stats about the high rate, rate of suicide uh, uh, with correction officers blew my mind because in my mind for so many years, correction officers was knuckle uh, dragging bullies, you know, and that made me look at them different. Say, whoa, and wonder why is their suicide rate so high? So learning more about them and them learning more about us it humanizes us. So I think that's very important. Thank you, Sam. I, 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 I want to add one of those things. I want to emphasize again what, what Sam just said. Correctional officers have an, a, a, one of the highest rates of suicide, alcoholism, divorce, all attributed to, to, to the work environment, environment. We've heard in the past the Norwegian model, so to speak, and how do uh, like how long do correctional officers last live after they've retired? Not a long time, but Norway is different. And so we've been looking at this Nor Norwegian model to ask why is it different? 
And part of it is we have to shift that culture, the culture we keep talking about, the us versus them. Here's the reality. These are the facts. People that are in custody are human beings that live in our community. Correctional officers that work in these institutions are human beings that live in our community. The potential for you to live next door to, to, to a correctional officer or correctional staff is there. You own a house, liable to live next door. Are you going to mean mug that person every time you come out? Or do you start looking at that person as a human being? And the same goes for correctional staff. 95 to 98 percent of people that are incarcerated are coming home. And one of the things is this is the, this is the reality. They can be your neighbor. So how do you want that person to come home? Do you want that person to come home healed and hold and, and, and working on becoming the best version of themselves, Or do you want to basically treat them as less than human, frustrate, aggravate and torture them more while incarcerated and, and, and take those programs away and, and allow them to come home worse than when they were when they came in? Whether we like it or not, we're all one community. Whether we agree with it or not, we're one community because people come home, period. Correction officers live in our communities, period. One of the things that we have to we, we have to when we look at this culture, we have to start saying we want better and more programs inside our, of, of our facilities because that's going to create a safer environment for everyone. Skip, uh, uh, same question to you. How important is it to include correctional officers in the rehabilitation of our incarcerated community member and what roles can they play? I just want to go back to what you just said. Number one, the victim and the suspect and law enforcement come out the same home. So you have families where one individual was shot and hurt. You got uh, the same family where an individual goes to jail for hurting people. Um, and you also have a cousin or an uncle who works inside the prison. So um, I want to make sure that that's understood that we are people. Um, both sides have the power to harm or to heal, whether you're talking about those who are being held captive inside these institutions and those who volunteer to come in, whether they get a check or they're free staff, we all come from the same culture. And that doesn't mean that um, my way of thinking is better than yours. What it means is we found, I'm gonna go back to what uh, Mr. Cunningham said earlier, is that we have found ways to separate ourselves and we found ways to create these differences. So I think that um, having the power to harm or to heal, at some point we have to heal because what's going to happen is the healthy community has to exist somewhere. I'm going to create a healthy community, whether it's in my bedroom, whether it's in a bottle, whether it's in smoking something, you know, whether it's in my garage, turn my garage into a, a man cave. I'm going to find somewhere to be healthy and it may not be with other people. So in that in itself, it's not healthy. So I think what happens is when we have individuals sit at the table together and we see our similarities and not our differences, what we're doing is creating a healthy environment, but this healthy environment may not be for us. It has to last generations after us. We have to find a way where um, staff, COs, police officers, sheriff don't live three or four years after they retire. You know, most of them go into another job, but you know, they leave and they go to the DA's office or they leave and they go to another department. So we have to make it to where we understand that we are all people. And I think, um, well, so Frankie Beverly and May said it best. They said, we are one. No matter what we do, we are one. No matter what we do, agree with you 100%. No, no matter what we do, we're, we're all interconnected in one way or the other. If, if you think about it like a freeway, if there's an accident 20 miles ahead of you and you got to get 20 miles ahead, you're connected to that. You're stuck in the traffic now. Like that, That's a simplistic way of putting it. But, but one way or another, what we choose to do or not to do, is going to affect us and, and, and generation to come, our children, our grand, grandchildren. Uh, Jacob, uh, how important is it to include correctional officers in the rehabilitation of our incarcerated community members and what role can they play? So, um, you know, we, we went to this, we went to the visit to CTF side that a lot of us did a lot of time there. Uh, one of the things that really stuck with me uh, was uh, something one of the officers said, uh, Flo Officer Flores, when he said that um, you know, I've been working here almost 30 years and I grew up with you guys. Um, and what that what that told me was that, you know, uh, and this has been reiterated over and over, but I, I, I still want to speak on it is that we are the same. Uh, we go through the same things. And, and a lot of times uh, when I look at correctional officers, uh, what I see is people who are suffering from traumas that Caesar described earlier. Uh, these are people um, who also need help. If you're a human, you need help. You need help being the best version of yourself, uh, but not 
some people don't necessarily know that they have the issues. And so a lot of these correctional officers have the same issues we have. They come from the same homes that we have. And to have a uh, fertile ground and to change the way the institution is running, uh, we can't just focus on the people that are incarcerated there. We also have to focus on the people who work there. Um, because uh, prison itself is a rehabilitative ground. It's, 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 it's called the Department of Corrections because prison is about corrections. Uh, and to take away the punitive value of prison, we would have to deal with that through administration. So that's why it's so important that administration and correctional officers are involved. Thank you, Jacob. Cesar, we're going to come to you next, but I, I wanted to point something out. Vivian, could you bring that image back up? So, so this was this was us uh, speaking or presenting to uh, correctional staff inside of Soledad. And the message that we presented to them was, you are stakeholders in the outcome of the individuals that are incarcerated, you're stakeholders. And things as simple as when we're trying to get to programming and there's a locked door that stops us from getting there, can you be the officer that opens that door to make sure that we're able to go into our rehabilitative programming? Can you be that officer that makes sure that, that, that I'm allowed to get my textbook for college? Can you be the officer that, that makes sure that, that, that programs run? And, and part of that is creating that environment that's safer for both the people that are in custody and the people that are working there. Their correctional officers are stakeholders because ultimately when we leave the institution, we're gonna leave one way or the other. We're gonna leave either better healed and whole and, and, and ready to give back to our communities or not. Uh, Caesar. Uh, how important is it to include correctional officers in the rehabilitation of our incarcerated community members and what role can they play? Um, I believe it's it's real important. Um, the role that can play is being supportive. Uh, I understand that um, when the COs are coming in to, to work as, as correctional officers, one of the things that, that's, that's, that's told to them is that all inmates are manipulators. All inmates just want to get over. You got to be careful. Don't trust them. And they come in with that mindset. So when someone is asking that they want to go to group or if their group is open or they can't see if, the, if their sponsor's there, they automatically go to, oh, these guys are trying to manipulate. This is what they told me in training. Um, so as, as far as they get away from that and just start believing and say, okay, these guys do want to change. They want, uh, you know, they want to rehabilitate themselves. Let me be the one that supports them because when we went back into Soledad, I ran into a lot of COs that I knew personally that were my bosses that used to open up the door. And one thing that I heard from every single one was how proud they were of the men that we were today. Um, one thing that they didn't expect to hear from us was the thank you. The thank you for what they did for us. The thank you for believing in us. The thank you for opening the doors for us. The thank you for, for, for humanizing us and giving us an opportunity to rehabilitate. So of course, this is very, very important, um, but just just to get involved, man, and support, support rehabilitation, you know? Thank you, Caesar. Jamel, same question to you. How important is it to include correctional officers in the rehabilitation, the rehabilitation of our incarcerated community members and what role can these correctional officers play? I'm going to keep it real brief because uh, I feel like I'm going to echo a lot of what was already said. Um, but I wanted to say when we went into the solid ad, uh, uh, my, my wing officer, Flores, I, I really had a chance to tell him that I appreciated uh, his role that he had. Because there would be times where the program wasn't running and I did I wasn't clear. I stayed on the third tier. He just knew that I had a, I was in a, uh, I had a pattern of going to self-help groups. And there would be times like he would come get me and wake me up to make sure that I was going to my groups in the dead sleep. The program might not have went on earlier in the day, but in the afternoon when he came on, he just knew I was one of the ones and he had come rock my door like, hey, Carter, you got program like, So I really, really was able to appreciate that. But one thing, other thing I wanna say, Sam, I know like it's been like jokely, kind of like jokingly said uh, 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 with the wardens that we had at, at Calipat, like one day the, the potential of being a neighbor is there. So I, I actually ran across uh, Warden Neil McDowell uh, uh, at, at uh, Ironwood. And so the just him seeing the work that me and Caesar was doing in prison to see, like, to run across him outside in the free world setting, like, it didn't feel awkward. And I thought, like, the relationship was built there that was kind of cool. 
like he actually called me by my name and said pronounce my name the correct way so it was just cool in that moment to sit there and didn't seem awkward to run and uh, run across him uh the warden there in the free world so i think that is very important uh, for the officers to be a part of the whole process of our rehabilitation i want to i want to also point something out thank you for that jamel everything you everyone just said here when we talk about the role that correctional officers plan rehabilitation in norway correctional officers see themselves as mentors that's night and day to compare to what we have today like literally a correction officer in norway will come sit at the table with you while you're eating breakfast or dinner and talk to you about your programming what your goals are what you what you what you're working on doing it and, and what your progress is we don't have that in, in in california or in the united states so so when we talk about the norwegian model there's got to be a, a a real hard shift of the culture inside and, and again with, with the other thing i want to I actually add is what you just said, uh, Jamel, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting, this is not language that I use, but the first time that I heard it uh, in Calipat uh, was the first time I heard it by uh, then Chief Deputy Warden Pilot, now Warden Pilot at uh, Donovan Correctional Facility. He told his staff that today, and I'm quoting again, today's inmate is tomorrow's neighbor. That's a fact. Today the, today, the person that's in custody can be your neighbor tomorrow. And so what we pour into the people that are in custody is vitally important in determining what their trajectory will be when they step out. And, and, and with that, I'm going to pivot to you, Jacob, and ask you this. How, like, do you see a difference in the reentry re journey of those who participated in programming as opposed to those who may not have? Uh, I do see a difference. Uh a lot of times the people uh, who choose not to participate in rehabilitative programming uh, tend to struggles with tend to struggle with a lot of the traumas of their of their past um, by not dealing with it. The resurfaces uh, they got was called triggers. Uh, and we were well educated on, on triggers on, in this panel. Uh, but a lot of people come out here and they get triggered. They go to a, a, a certain street, certain house, get around certain people and old behavior traits start to pop back up um, and then they find themselves uh, uh, reincarcerated uh, and a lot I, I, and, and and there's a lot of people who don't fit that pattern uh, I'm talking about in general uh, and then a lot of people who taste the programs uh, they come out with a different uh, view of of what they want their life to look like they, they create an unprecedented future uh, that they can live into and they don't fall into the same traps they don't they don't react the same way to the triggers because they have tools they've been given tools in these groups uh to help them recognize when they're slipping and making bad decisions and their character is being jeopardized so uh i think it's a big difference and i think when you take the time to really look uh you'll see that these rehabilitative programmings really do work and it provides uh, not only safety for the institution, but also the public at large. Thank you, Jacob. And, and Skip, you've been, when we talk about reentry, uh, I, I, I don't want to age you anything, but you kind of like the godfather doing some of this stuff uh, when it comes to reentry. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and we kind of like the grandkids or something like that, because because you, you've you been doing this reentry piece, uh, intervention work and all this work in the community for, for a while now. Have you seen a change or, or what would you say, like, do you see a difference in the reentry journey of those that, that have come home? Like you, you've seen the past 10 years, all these lifers that have come home that did so much work. And then you've also seen like people who may have done what, what we call like wino time, two, three years here, two, three years there and caught up in this cycle. Can you describe to us like what has been the difference in that journey when it comes to people that have gone through a lot of rehabilitation? Well, first of all, brother, just look at the panel. I told you that I wasn't going to use the term inmates, but I'm going to use it for the individuals who are here right now. The inmates got the keys. And I ain't talking about the keys to the yard. I'm talking about the keys to success in the community, man. If you look right now, all the years of prison right here, I'm not going to add it up. You know, I'm going to put it together some kind of way, but it's, it's well over almost 200 years of prison time just on this panel. And I'm the one with the wino time. All right. But here, here's the difference. The difference is programming wasn't around. I got a D number in 86. Programming wasn't around. So the programming came from the big homie. And of course, you know, that program was all bad. 
Um, so what you guys have got to be the pioneers and be a part of is them SAP trailers and them self-help groups, as uh, the brother Jamil was just talking about, man. That's a, that's a blessing to be able to change the behavior, the attitude, the mindset while inside. But then here's the thing that used to always happen for me while I'm doing my wine on time is that people would get out and forget about us inside. So what you guys have done has not, you've not forgotten. Uh, you guys have learned certain things and, and just listening to Jacob talk about the triggers, man. And, and that's something that I don't care what program you go to. If you come home and you go to ARC, that's fine. If you go to Flint Ridge Center, if you go to Barrios Unidos or Homies Unidos, if you go to Homeboys Industry and Second Call, um, Susan Burton's New Way of Life, it does not matter. One of us represents all of us. You know, because as soon as one dude steals a fire truck and busts through the gate when he's on short time, and this dude had to have at least um, like maybe a year left or whatever. But now they put that on everybody that works with us and everybody we're working with. So I think the difference is by you guys having keys now, each key represents a responsibility. You know, coming home, you got a key to the house, right? Because your family thought, okay, you're responsible for that one key. But then some of y'all talked your mama and I ain't trusted over there. Let me get a key to your house too, right? So you get a key back to your mama house as well. And then you get a key at work and you get a car key. And before you know it, you are responsible. You are responsible. So that's the difference is let me go back in the solid dad with any one of y'all. And what we got to do, we got to get a door. We got to get unlocked. We got to go tell your friend, uh, what's the name, Ramirez or whoever y'all talking about. I got to get unlocked. You feel me? Because they didn't trust me with the keys. Society now trusts you guys with the keys. I've been out since uh, 2005. I got keys. And I'm sure you guys got just as many as I do. That's the difference. Amen. Amen, brother. I got to speak. Amen. Hey, thank, thank you for that, Skip. Uh, uh, and Caesar, you've been doing a lot of work with, with the, the pre-apprenticeship boot camp that we have. And so you've been able to see both the work that you've done inside, your own personal journey, then the life coaching you've done inside facilities. And now you're seeing different people come home, some that have gone through rehabilitation, some that have not. What is Do you see a difference in the journey, uh, especially when you talk about commitment, showing up on time, having a good attitude? Uh, all of those things that are required for you to make it in the unions. Do you see a difference in in, in, in what you're seeing right now? Oh, absolutely, Sam. You know, today being at the food bank in Silmar, uh, I was able. You, you're able to. You know, our part part of our job is to to see who is the one that's that's that we're going to be able to vouch for at the end of the program to get hired. And um, so we're look, we're dealing with a lot of different characters. So the ones that the life inmates that did the work. You could tell how they're humble, respectful. They're quiet. They don't ask questions. They do. They, they follow. They know how to follow instructions. As to the ones that did a little bit of time, and like Skip said, wine on time. You know, you could tell like the difference really quick because they're the ones that. Well, why do I have to do that? And, what, and, and I'm constantly like, I feel like a. I'm in high school again because they're around the corner smoking when they were just told not to be smoking. Um, they're over here shooting the stuff in the air instead of working. Um, so you can tell, you can tell already, like, okay, these are the ones that probably never really did the rehabilitation in prison. And then you got the ones that really did the work and you could really see the difference. And it's a huge difference. And it's important for, for these men to realize that that's the rehabilitation is what's going to keep you employed because those triggers, those, those, um, you know, that, that attitude, the laziness, the procrastination is what's going to get you fired. And you've worked very hard to be put in a position in a union trade for you to lose it because you're not showing up on time or you're not or you don't know how to follow simple instructions. You know, so I can definitely see the difference, you know, with this cohort. OK, I, I want to go to Sam. Thank you, Cesar. I want to go to uh, Mr. Cunningham. You're a re-entry coordinator up in Santa Cruz, and you've been doing this this uh, work for a while. Uh, like I watched your journey home. The the like I always talk about you and, and many of the others. The, the beginning point where you worked at first, and then your trajectory. Because oftentimes people are like, well, I want to just do this job. No, you got it. Like sometimes you have to start where you start at to get where you want to go. But uh, for you in your experience as a re-entry coordinator. Do you see a difference in the, in the reentry journey of those who have participated in, in, in programming? 
Absolutely. Uh, and I'm uh, again, I'm going to say uh, use the phrase I used earlier. When you don't know, you don't know. Uh, and I've probably talked to each one of you guys uh, and said this uh, uh, many times when we were still behind the walls that uh, once we're we become uh, equipped with the tools and uh, uh, I always said that everybody on the outside should be mandated to go through these self-help programs as well because uh, people get caught up with work, bills, kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and really don't understand how to communicate, how to uh, 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 work through uh, uh, situations. So once we became educated and uh, uh, knowledgeable on triggers, I had never heard of triggers before. So these are things like that where our family members don't understand. But something, this is uh, uh, the difference that I see more than anything with these self-help uh, programs is something that Second Call and Skip and my boy Lil Man, uh, my co-defendant, always screaming at the top of their voice, I'd rather be two hours early than two minutes late for work. So that's the key right there. When you've been through all of these programs and all of the things we've been through, we're going to do every single thing in our power not to to be successful, not to uh, fail. Uh, so that's what I see, the commitment. All of us, have, we've discussed, we was discussing it when we was all together a couple of weeks ago. All of our families, all of our loved ones tell us, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. All of us here on the panel today, 16-hour days, 18-hour days, sometimes 20-hour days, you know. And we did that to get out of prison. We did that for years before we even walked out. So having 18 hour, 20 hours days now out here is just normal to us. Thank you. That, that That's a good point. I, I, I'm hoping my wife is watching because like, she'd be like, you work too much. Uh, <laughs> if if y'all don't see me, come look for me for saying that. Uh, but no, seriously. <laughs> uh, uh, wanna wanna uh, switch. Uh, first, just want to give a couple of shots out. Thank you to our little sister, Dominique. Uh, uh, also to Erica Quinn, looking forward to Tony, uh, Mr. Quinn coming home. I know you, you got the news uh, when he's going to be home. He'll be home in the next few days after doing uh, over 20 years inside. Uh, so, so welcome home. Uh, that, that's the best news ever. Congratulations. And tell him we'll be waiting for him to come uh, to the ARC office when he gets here. Uh, Jamil, uh, uh, as, co as, as concisely as possible, what message do you want to send to our incarcerated community and or correctional officers? Oh, that's good. That's a good one there. Uh, to my brothers and sisters incarcerated, uh, man, I want to say keep doing the work, doing the work because it works. I mean, that's when we keep talking about, you know, being successful out here. Like it's not going to happen by accidents because you're going to be faced with challenges. So I would just say do the work and then, uh, to the to the to the administration and staff, uh, man. Um, this is me. When you say changing the narrative, Sam, I really believe it's going to be like we're going to have to operate from unconditional love, bro. Like that's something that we might all need to still yet grow into. But to the uh, to operate with just unconditional uncon love, man. Like we talking about second chances. I'm one of the ones that had to have three and four, five different chances. So you know, sometimes like just humanizing us, man, giving us a second chance, be willing to, you know, not hold us accountable, but give us a chance, man. So that, I'll just leave it at that, brother. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, Caesar, uh, what is the message you want to give to our, our, our incarcerated community and our correctional officers? Uh, for our communities, our men and women, please continue doing the work. Don't give up. Even at some times when, um, you know, I was once, that way I, I got denied a board and I felt like giving up and throwing in the towel. Don't just keep doing the work. Uh, sometimes they see stuff in us that we don't see ourselves. And, um, and we need to work on that. Trust and believe that whatever they tell you need to work on, please work, continue to work on it. And as for the staff, just continue to support, continue to support because we are the proof that that rehabilitation works. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Uh, what message do you want to send to our incarcerated community and or correctional officers? I 
for administration and correctional officers, I would like to send a message just to keep providing the space, uh, provide the space so people can do the work. Um, and for uh, our population or our, our, our fellow uh, men that's inside, uh, I, I would say uh, create an unprecedented future, man. Uh, sit down and write out a five-year plan uh, where you want to be in five years. And then from that, from the five-year plan where you want to be, look back and see how to get there. Uh, it's a proven method. It works. Uh, but you have to write it out and be very specific and keep on pushing. Stay committed to being a better person. Absolutely. Thank you, Jacob. Skip. What message do you want to send our incarcerated community and, and, and or correction officers? I want to first have everybody look at the fire department as our heroes. And the reason I say that is because if they come to any establishment that's on fire, they're not asking for water. They're not asking for the keys to the gate. They have every tool necessary to put that fire out when they show up. So for the staff that's in, um, inside these prisons and for the individuals who are waiting to come home, we are peacemakers. So if we don't bring peace with us, then it may not be there. We have to bring the tools of peace with us when we go to work, when we go to the yard, when we go to groups, wherever we go, when we go to visits with our family, we have to bring all the tools of peace with us to be able to pass the peace on, to be the instruments of the peace. So I want everybody just to, to do that and know that uh, we are the peacekeepers, we are the peacemakers, we are the peace takers, we are the instruments of peace. And if we align ourselves with the fire department, we bring peace with us. Thank you so much, Skip. Appreciate that. I, I, like I'm using that. I'm, I'm stealing that. I'm gonna quote you once, and then I own it. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham, Actually, great time. Uh, what's the message you want to give to our incarcerated community and/or correctional officers? Well, for for both, for both, uh, what we started off saying that challenge the culture, challenge the culture of us against them. You know, when I uh, look at the uh, person across from you as a human being, you know, as an individual and don't clump them together as us against them, what they taught you, all that crap in the uh, uh, academy, throw that out the window and, and really, really engage as a human being. For our, for our uh, relatives incarcerated, my message to you is don't give up. Never, ever give up. Every single morning you wake up with breath in your body. You got a chance to get it right. It was, uh, I can't remember what step it was. Jacob uh, probably remember better than me, but one of the gogi steps was uh, even when I make a mistake, if I if I took 10 steps forward and fall backwards, I fall, fall, I'm still nine steps ahead of where I was or whatever uh, before. A lot of times I would try and then I would mess up. And I'm like, why even try? You are who you are. And I had to get that out of my mind. We all make mistakes. Don't throw yourself away when you make a mistake. Mistake. Learn from it. Uh, continue to grow and continue to have hope. Never, ever give up. That's my message. Never, ever give up. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. It reminds me of uh, a, a story that you once told when we were together. When I had told you, I, like, I'm done with this. I don't want to be involved with the gang stuff no more. It's like, all right, cool. Remember, you, you know what you're doing, huh? Yeah. And I remember coming back around the corner and the riot kicks off and we end up in a hole, like literally end up in a hole when I was first making the, like my first steps to like really wanting to change. And where do I end up in a hole? I didn't quit. Went to the board eight times, denied eight times. I didn't quit. I didn't give up hope. I didn't let go. I kept trying, kept trying, kept trying, as we all did. And so my message to people, to all of our community members that are inside, Remember that there are us out here that are fighting for you, that are pushing for you. Don't give up hope. Don't stop working on yourself. Every tool that you're able to put in your toolbox while you're incarcerated, to learn from, you'll be able to use when you come home. I guarantee you that both in your professional and in, in your interpersonal life. Just don't quit and know that we're out here to support you. To the correctional staff that are in these facilities, we want you to be able to have a good marriage and have all those great things, a, a decrease the suicide rate. But in order to do that, we need you to understand that you have to have an investment in human beings that are currently in the carceral system. They're not your enemies. They're people that made bad choices just as I made bad choices. But you are a stakeholder in the outcome of the human beings that are inside those facilities. Remember that. It's vitally important to understand that those people that are inside 
are one day going to be your neighbors. With that said, I want to thank everybody for joining. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank our incredible panelists that, that, that have been here today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Continue to do that, that, that work. You're my, my, my brothers in arms. And uh, for our audience, uh, we'll be back July 23rd. We're doing this bi-weekly. Uh, join us on the 23rd at 12 p.m., same bat time, same bat channel, as I always say. And at the end of the show, you're going to have the information for both Barrios Unidos and Second Call Posted. Please contact these informations if you have the, these organizations, if you have loved ones that need help. Thank you. God bless and take care. Shout out. Bye.